want to get back to Dijkstra's solution if we don't have any of these extra hardware supports. If both of the, these are things that Dijkstra's atomic memory did not provide. Didn't provide any atomic instructions that involve being able to read and write at the same time. None of these solutions we've looked at so far solve the problem that we, we started with. The practical solutions, if we have modern processors, or even processors going back a long way, they've added special instructions to make it easier to solve this. So this was the solution. If you're wondering why Dijkstra's wearing a cowbell, that's a good question. You can follow the link and figure it out. But this was his, his code. So before we get into how this works, how do we like this code? So we've looked at code from Apple's SSL implementation, we looked at OpenSSL last class, and we looked at Apache's SU exec, and we looked at some other examples of code. Where does Dijkstra fit in comparison to those different programs we've looked at? Do we like his coding style? Does it seem likely to produce correct programs? Ah, okay, yes. So it's got lots of go-tos in it. So here's a go-to, here's a go-to, here's a go-to. It also has pretty poor variable names. Right? It's got B and C as these arrays with no clue what they stand for. Those are things that, at least from today's standards, you might look back and say, well, this is not the cleanest way to write this code. Now, in fairness to Dijkstra, this was 1965. So some of the conventions we have today were not, not around. And Hunter mentioned this dislike of GoTo, which Dijkstra famously wrote a letter to the communications of the ACM about GoTo statement being harmful and advocating that high-level programming languages should not provide something like GoTo. And we've seen from the Apple code that people have not completely got the message on that yet. But this was 1968, three years after the code that was in the mutual exclusion example. It might have been he had not seen the light yet on not liking GoTo, and he starts with, for a number of years, I've had this observation that the quality of programmers is a decreasing function of the density of GoTo statements, and I think that is probably still a good observation, at least from the example code we've looked at in both the buggy SSL code compared to the Apache SU exec code. The other justification for the GoTo's here is this is really not high-level code. He's saying we shouldn't have GoTo's in high-level code, this is code for providing a very low-level primitive. It's more justifiable to have a go-to there. But it does make it harder to follow. The poor choice of variable names, I don't know what would be a good excuse for that, other than maybe typesetting conventions of the day. So these names of B and C for these important arrays give you very little clue what they are there, why they're there. You had some time to think about this code. What would be good names for B and C? Did anyone understand this code well enough to understand what those arrays should be called? So let's look at, look at B first. So B initially is all trues. These arrays are indexed by the processor number. So value BI is only written to by processor I, but everyone can read them. The places where BI is written to are just here and here. What does BI mean? How long is BI false? Is it almost always false or almost always true, if this is the only code there is? So it's initially true, and it gets set to true here. When is bi true? Yeah, basically, it's true. If this is all the code, the only time bi is true is from here up to when you re-enter the loop. So it's almost always false. The b array just means, does this process have something it wants to do? I'm not sure why b was chosen for it. Maybe it stands for something in Dutch. But it's just, if the B value is false, it means this processor wants to do something. If the B value is true, it means this processor has no work to do. So the B array is not that important. The C array is the one that's important. We need to know that only one program can be in the critical section. That means there's no way to interleave the executions of two threads where they both can enter the critical section at once. Let's assume, so here's thread one. In order to get into the critical section, what has to be true? What's being checked before we enter the critical section? The most immediate thing before it is this loop. If we did the go to here, we don't get to the critical section. So what is that loop doing? So I'm talking about the, the 4J loop here. This if is checking if k is equal to i. But the most immediate check before we get into our critical section is this loop that is going through 
all the indices and checking that the C value, right, so we have the C array, if J is not equal to I, so that means the one that's our self, we're not checking. So let's say I equals three. So if either one of the conjuncts is false, then we don't do the AND. So it doesn't matter what's in the value where J equals I. All of the other ones, in order for not to do the go to, if CJ is false, then not CJ would be true, and we do the go to. So CJ has to be true. So we'll only get into the critical section if all the C values are true. This is kind of counterintuitive. I think it would have made more sense if the value of true and false were switched here, that we're checking that they're all false. But the way it's written, it's checking that they're all true. And what we did before the loop was set our C value to false. This code only enters the critical section if no other processor has set its C value to true. Is this enough to provide mutual exclusion? So if this were atomic, the rule is you only enter the critical section if all of the other CI values are true. Would that provide mutual exclusion? Some other thread is going through this. J is not going to be I for this, and this was false. Because I set my CI value to false, it cannot enter the critical section. So it wouldn't be able to get through that loop. So this seems to provide mutual exclusion. So this is how Dijkstra argues that it does. We're saying that there are no two computers could enter this critical section. They could never get through this loop without finding another one that had set that to false. So the only way for one to get through that is if it's the only one that does. This is a little bit of a sketchy argument by itself. This would be fine by itself if we knew this was atomic. But of course, if that was atomic, then we've got a much more powerful memory system or processor than we thought we had. We also need to know that none of these values could change during the loop. How do we know that? I will leave that for you to think about for next class. An important part of knowing that we provide mutual exclusion is knowing that if we get through that loop, no other thread could have got through it at the same time.